God is good. All the time. Hallelujah. Uh, this week, uh, this Sunday, we welcome all of you to join us for this uh, Sunday service in Livingstone Methodist Church. Uh, I think uh, all of us have a very interesting and uh, last week. Uh, <laughs> so we have uh, we thank God for having a new uh, PM and uh, general election 15 was uh, carried out uh, successfully and peacefully. Thank God for all this. And we continue to look forward for good governance. And uh, of course, I think everybody is waiting for the new cabinet. We trust our Lord will give us uh, better hope. Huh? Okay. <clears throat> so uh, this morning, welcome all of you. I don't see any new faces. Two. All right, anyway, we welcome them later on. <laughs> okay. Today, or this Sunday, is the first Sunday of Advent. So, uh, <clears throat> Lighting a candle is a symbol yet profound act. It is a testimony to the power of light over darkness. Even the light of one candle can reveal our faces as we stand near the candle. As we light the candle, we begin our journey to Christmas, a day of joy and celebrations. The first candle on the Advent wreath is called the Prophecy Candle. It opens the period that anticipates Christmas and remembers those who first spoke the promise of the coming of Christ's child. One candle burning bright, chasing away the darkness from light. One candle glowing light, the blessings of God giving new sight. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 to 5, says that, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples and they shall bet their swords into process and their spears into frowning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let us pray. God of light, place a candle in our hearts so we may walk as children of the light, treading gently on the paths of peace 
and ever ready to welcome the signs of new life. Amen. Let us pray the opening prayer. When, O oh God, will the day of peace come? When will the nations stream to your holy mountain and beat their sword into plowshares? When will the long night of war and hatred give way to the dawn of love, righteous and joy? We are ready for the dawn, O oh God, Shine your light into our world, mighty one of peace. Illuminate the path and give us the wisdom and courage to follow your light. We pray in the name of the Prince of Peace. Amen. Shall we all rise for the call to worship? Let us state it uh, responsively. I was glad when they said to me, Let us, Let us go, go to, to the, the house of, of the Lord. Lord. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established at the highest of the mountains. Come, come let, let us, us go us up to the mountain of, of the Lord. Please uh, remain standing for the acts of praise uh, to be led by Sister Melody. Thank you. Good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to be back and worship together with each one of you. So let us prepare our hearts to worship our Lord. We're going to sing, we're going to sing two songs to this morning. Uh, it might be a little new for some of you, but don't worry. It's very, very easy and very meaningful song. So the first song is Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. And the second song is Goodness of God.
accordingly. And we are living each day in the goodness of God. So let us sing the next song, Goodness of God. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we want to sing and shout joyfully and come to you with thanksgiving hearts. Father, you are the greatest, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Father, we thank you for our new prime minister and the new government that have been formed. We thank you for the wisdom of the Argon and other rulers of the wise decision that was made after many days of uncertainty following the results of GE15. Father, we pray for our newly elected Prime Minister, for him to have wisdom when he forms his cabinet. Father, we pray that he will select people who can work together with him in bringing our country forward and make us great once again. We pray that you will also bless him with good health as he performs his duties as Prime Minister. We know that it's a lot of work for him to do. We ask that you grant him the strength that he needs. 
We pray that you watch over his cabinet as well, Father. Father, may he be the role model for us as citizens of Malaysia, a role model as to how to be a loving husband and father in the family, how to perform our tasks and jobs with integrity at our workplace, and the tenacity to fight for the righteous and justice for others. Father, as we Malaysians enjoy tomorrow as a public holiday, we want to remember people who had worked very hard during GE15. Father, we pray that you grant them a restful day to recover from their tiredness. Thank you, Father, for listening to our prayers. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we all rise for the affirmation of faith? We shall pray it together. We are not alone. alone. We, we live, live in God's world. world. We believe in God, God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, new who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are, we are called, called to be the Church, to celebrate, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve, and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Shall we pray the offering prayer together? Thank you, God. Thank you for the wake up call, reminding us to be ready. Thank you for not giving up on your vision of peace. Thank you for the opportunity to gather each week in your house that we might encourage one another to stay on your path. And thank you for the opportunity to give these gifts for your ministry, that together we might help the world be ready to receive the Prince of Peace, in whose names we pray. Amen. As usual, uh, you can uh, come forward, those who are which, I mean, those who wish to uh, end in your offering can uh, come forward now. <coughs> and also, you may bank in or transfer funds through uh, our internet banking to Livingston Methodist Church Alliance Bank uh, account. And of course, you also can do, through, do it now, uh, Uh, please be reminded if you use the internet banking, you don't mind to forward your or, or just a copy of a paying, uh, pay in the slip to our church treasurer, Brother James Day. Yeah, just now uh, we miss our friends uh, who come for the first time. So I was informed uh, 
two of them, right? Where, where are they? All right, you just <laughs> say hello to each other, huh? all right? I understand that the sister Wen Yi and uh, William from Zelodong, Penang, Chinese Methodist Church. Welcome both of you. Shall we give them the cross? <laughs> we'd like to see you next week, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we also uh, welcome all of you. And uh, this morning, we are also uh, privileged to have uh, Reverend uh, Jiam Teng Po, and he is no stranger to us. I think all of us know him, right? Let him introduce himself later, huh? <laughs> Welcome, uh, Reverend Jam, to come to our church to share God's word, huh? Okay, for, for parish news, huh? uh, this one is a reminder. We have uh, sent out in the chat group that uh, every week we have the prayer items. So uh, do go through and uh, when you do your prayer time the, or quiet time you can pray over the items right yeah uh, next week supposed to be a, a holy communions uh, week but uh, due to the uh, changes of uh, the date of uh, holding this annual conference for the seventh annual conference. So the changing of date of annual conference also because of change, <laughs> because of election, uh, general elections. So uh, next week will not be have uh, any uh, Holy Communion, but the following week, meaning to say the second Sunday will be our Holy Communion. Only for next month. Uh, Okay, this is uh, another reminder. And those who are interested to join or want to uh, bring some uh, food or what, please register yourself uh, with uh, Brother Stephen or my wife, uh, Jenny. <laughs> okay, so they are organizing this, uh, no? Look through this. Uh, our Christmas party or pop bless party. Yeah? So uh, it's scheduled on 18 December at uh, 9 BU condominium. Uncle Peter is a uh, master of uh, ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> he did a lot of good work behind the scene, nobody knows. He, he asked for a uh, registration of car because so that your car can be allowed to go in. This is all the regulations and all these things. And then he got to go to the management there to book the, they call it barbecue place. Huh? What is the exact name for that? <laughs> Messaline the floor, somewhere like that. Yeah, so uh, uh, this one, uh, do uh, welcome to bring your friends especially those uh, non-believers to join us for these uh, happy occasions. Remember, schedule on 18 December, start from 6.30, yeah? if I'm not wrong, 6.30? Uh, 6, <laughs> all right. You can come early and join us all. And then if you, there are two things uh, you, you, you have to do is, uh, three things, sorry. Number one, you register your name, Number two, you have to inform uh, what car you are bringing in the car plate registration number, all right? So that uh, Uncle Peter will arrange the management site to allow your car to be in. Eh? Third one is what kind of food or anything that you want to bring in or if you wish to share with us. Okay, that's it. I think that's all. <laughs> Shall we all rise for the doxology then?
please remain standing for the hymns of preparation. How great thou art. This morning, a uh, scripture reading is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 23, verse 1 to verse 12. Matthew, chapter 23, verse 1 to verse 12. Shall we say it together? Then Jesus, then Jesus said, said to, to the, the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders but they, they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move, to move them. them. Everything they, they do is done for people to see. They, they make their white and, and the tassels, tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect 
in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Okay, uh, now we shall invite uh, Reverend Chiang to come forward to share God's word. Uh, can we give him a round of applause for inviting Uh, thank you, uh, Brother Howard. First, a uh, very uh, personal uh, word of thanks and appreciation to uh, Pastor Lucy, especially uh, uh, when Ernest was uh, recently hospitalized. Uh, thank you so much for your care and your concern. Uh, also, thank you, uh, church leaders, for allowing me to uh, worship with all of you uh, this morning. And good morning, church. God, it is hard to be humble. <laughs> well, when we look at this title, I believe that uh, we know what it says, right? This title says it all. Uh, in our secular society, uh, honorary titles, uh, position, status, and recognition are things that people sought after. Now with all this comes honor, privilege, uh, prestige, power, or sometimes even wealth. And also with this, you receive a lot of attention, admiration, and also authority. This is the world. However, from my own personal observation, this same vanity is now prevailing in the church. When I talk about the church, I'm talking about Christendom, not any particular church. Right? In our Christian society, I think this same kind of vanity is slowly creeping into the churches. Now, what appears to be a descriptive nouns to highlight the uh, functions of the ministry in the Bible has now become honorific titles worn with pride and pomp. Now, I grew up knowing only these three, bishops, pastors, and elders. That's when I grew up. But nowadays, we have people who uh, call themselves or want to sell themselves as apostles, prophets, shepherds, even God's anointed. Today is no more appealing to be uh, called a reverend. <laughs> we like uh, more uh, high-class titles. So we have apostles, uh, prophets, and all these things. Now, people, we are very particular about how other people see us and how other people address us. It is always nice to be a VIP, a Greek, ah? But it is even nicer to be a VVIP, <laughs> right? Now, in our society at present, a postmodern uh, era, impressing people, displaying our achievements, is an in thing. It's like sort of becoming a, a culture. You know? uh, so we try to uh, show who we are. When we can afford, we buy Rolex watches. If we cannot afford, then at least we can buy imitation. Uh, to show off a little bit, well, at least I got Rolex watch. Huh? Now, when we look at the lifestyle of people, we find that you know, uh, 
people will go for uh, luxury cars. Now, apart from the uh, safety features, the comfort it affords, no, we cannot deny that, uh, the very safety features. But behind all this is also that element of uh, no, status. Uh, right behind that, this element of this status. No, driving a luxury car actually is a status symbol. Uh, it's a status symbol. We announce to the world, we announce to people, we tell them, I am successful. I can afford that. Uh, I can afford to drive this. Because with my position, I must drive something that is equal to my status. Uh, you, can, uh, you cannot ask our new prime minister to drive a kanchil lah. Petoka. Uh, because of his status. Another avenue that people show off is that no, they will join uh, exclusive clubs. Uh, they will join exclusive clubs. And uh, sometimes you also notice this, that people move to, uh, to uh, what they call, to an uh, upscale neighborhood or they buy uh, homes, uh, houses in uh, posh areas. And as we see and as we observe, we find that houses uh, have been getting bigger and bigger. Why is this so? Well, in our society, houses have always been a public projection of our wealth and status. Look, I'm able to afford to live in such kind of an uh, environment. I can afford uh, all these big houses. All these, uh, many of these things, is a reflection of self-vanity. Now, please do not get me wrong. I uh, do not take offense by what I'm saying. Oh, don't misunderstand in what I'm sharing. I'm not against all these things. I'm not against wealth. I'm not against achievements. Neither do I begrudge uh, those who have been conferred honorary titles in recognition of their contributions to society. I always believe that people who have worked hard and are successful deserve to enjoy the fruits of their labors. They deserve to be respected, to be honored, for their status and for what they have contributed to society. Uh, we need to learn to respect these people. Uh, in my own personal uh, experiences, now I have known of some very truly rich people who are very low-key. Right? Very low-key, they keep a very low profile. But I also know of some not-so-rich people. They like to throw their weights around. They like to talk loud. And I'm not referring to their decibels, uh, the volume of their voice. They just want to throw their weights around. Now, what I'm sharing this morning, I want us to be uh, clear about this. Is the issue here is not about your office. It's not about your position. It's not about your wealth no, uh, or your success. But it is about you, right? about, about us personally. So what kind of person, uh, what kind of a person finds it hard to be humble? The answer is, it is hard to be humble for the person who thinks and feels that he is so self-important. That's the key. Now what we are going to learn together to get today is how do we handle our success? How do we handle our promotion? How do we handle our status? even uh, our appointments, just sharing uh, what, what I observe and uh, what I see uh, along the way. People can be very low-key when uh, no, they are nobody. Uh, or to put in other words, they can be a bit humble okay, when they are nobody. But the moment they get certain promotions and all this, they want to show right, who they are. Now, so what we are going to learn today, this morning together, is know how we handle uh, all these successes uh, that comes our way. Uh, uh, we'll reflect and review what kind of a person we are. And not only that, how we conduct ourselves in this kind of situation will also determine God's verdict about us. Uh, what God thinks about us, okay? Now, the world around us, people around us, they are very concerned about the outward self. But what God is concerned about His people, about you and I, 
is about our inward values, our inward quality. Now, in the Bible, we find that there are many lessons, there are many stories on being humble. But there are also warnings against pride. So this morning, we want to look at uh, lessons, one of the lessons from Matthew chapter 23 that we read together just now. Now here in this passage, Matthew chapter 23, we find Jesus calling out two particular groups of people. Okay, and also uh, inside this passage, we also find out what Jesus Christ says about them, or Christ's verdict uh, about these people. Now these two groups of people, Okay, these two groups of people, they have one thing in common. And they are both associated with religion. Uh, with religion, scribes and Pharisees. And together, these two groups of people have positioned themselves you know, to become champions or custodians of the law. They took upon themselves to be the leaders, the official authority of God's law. Uh, they become interpreters and instructors of it. Now, if I can uh, just uh, make some mention of these people, if there's any connection between these two groups of people, I would uh, describe them as this. The scribes are the legislators. They are the ones who make the laws, right? Who uh, interprets and makes the laws. And the Pharisees are the uh, fanatical implementers. They are the special elite forces, or today we call them the moral police. Right? They are the ones right, who will do it. Now, when we look into scriptures, we find that originally the laws and commandments uh, was given by God through Moses, right, to the Israelite people. The Levites they were tasked or they were uh, uh, chosen, right, to lead in the religious duties associated with the tabernacles, the ministries of God. And later, when we look at uh, church history or biblical history, the Levites later function as instructors, as, in, uh, as interpreters of God's law. Right? So slowly their, their, their roles right, take on more meaning. But if, when we go back to Matthew, Matthew 23, especially in verse 2, let us hear what Jesus said about them. The Lord says, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. What does that mean? Well, very simply, it means that now this group of people, the scribes and the Pharisees, they have taken over Moses' office. They have replaced the authority you know, of Moses. Or in today's language, they say, move over Moses. Now we are the government. <laughs> we are the new government. We make the laws now. <laughs> okay. Right. So uh, let's first look, zoom in on the, fa on the scribes. Who were the scribes? Now, the scribes were a group of people, well-learned people. They are familiar, okay? Uh, we do not begrudge them. They are truly familiar with uh, the, the written laws and even the oral laws or during those times. Nothing wrong about this, right? To be a well-versed, uh, to know all these things, there is nothing wrong in, 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 this, in this. And this group of people, were the ones that before there were printing presses, before there were this, uh, what we call a cut and paste uh, application, uh, right? they were the ones who will uh, copy right, the ancient text by hand. So they are well versed, uh, or they are very knowledgeable. And what they are doing is also something that is very uh, notable, uh, something that is noble, something that is good, okay? Uh, a, a good responsibility. Nothing wrong about this either. Okay. Now, because of who they were and what they were doing, they also enjoy great authority, great support from the priests and the Levites. In other words, they became a privileged class of people. Again, nothing wrong about this. Uh, right? There's nothing wrong to be uh, all this. And along the way, we find that because of who they were, what they were doing, and uh, all, the, all the things that uh, the perch, no, the, the, that comes uh, 
after this, they also receive the admiration of the people. Now, when we think about this, again, it's natural, right? Nothing uh, wrong in all these things. But uh, what is wrong? Is that we know because of their situation, because of their position, or the attention that they were receiving, this became you know, a fertile condition to inflate the person's ego. And that is actually what is happening with many of us. There is nothing wrong in what we are doing or what we are the position that we are holding. What is wrong is inside here, our hearts. How do we handle all these things? And Jesus Christ's verdict of these people is that, well, something is wrong with their hearts. Right? No, something is wrong with, with their hearts. Nothing wrong with what they were doing. So when we receive all the attention, we receive all the admiration, and we receive all the privileges, no, then it is very easy for our head to grow big, no, to swell. It is so easy for us to feel so self-important about myself. Sometimes it goes to the point that without me, uh, no, you all can do nothing. No, I'm indispensable. Uh, so, boleh tarik tarik harga sikit lah. Uh, well, that is where our problem lies, and, and this is the problem with the scribes. Okay. Now, let us look at the Pharisees. Now, who were the Pharisees? They are also a group of people, all right. And this group of people are the ones who take pride in what they think about themselves, uh, what they think about themselves, and what they are doing. How did they look upon themselves? They see themselves as the keepers of the law. They represent the true standards of religion uh, during those days. Okay. In a contemporary setting, perhaps we might say, we are the true church. Uh, we are the ones who are, who are very true to biblical teaching. Uh, we are the ones who hold uh, very strong to our doctrine. What we are doing is right, and what you people are doing is not so right. right? Perhaps we may not say that it's wrong, but what we are doing is better. Right? And uh, because of this, they feel so proud about themselves. And in their pride, they want to show off. They want to show everybody, look, this is the way things have to be done. This is it, no? The way. So in uh, verses 3 to 5 from Matthew chapter 23, we find our Lord Jesus Christ exposing their characters. Uh, exposing their characters. And uh, Jesus Christ also let us have a look at their brand of spirituality, their perception of religion. And we can identify uh, or we can adopt, you know, apply it to our current situation in the churches. We find that uh, similar, right? Similar. So this group of people, the Pharisees, they are very concerned about performance. Uh, they are very concerned about how they appear before other people, their appearance. And in some translations, it's what Jesus is being uh, written. They, they are just concerned about all these things, but they are not concerned about the truth. And uh, in Matthew 23, we find that Jesus Christ giving some specifics about these people, about their actions and about their behaviors, uh, which we will discover as we go along. Now, what is it that uh, they take pride about themselves? Uh, they are very passionate about their belief very, very passionate about their religion, but they have no compassion. Uh, they are very passionate, but they have no compassion. They are very demanding about the legal observations of rules and regulations, but very indifferent to reality, the real struggles and needs of the people around them. And we find all this as we study the Bible. Or in the words of C.S. Lewis, these group of people are so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good. Right? Secondly, what Jesus said about them is that they speak from lofty positions 
but they do not often practice what they preach. Right? You do what I say, but don't do what I do. Do not in so many words. Uh, but that is actually their characteristics. That's how their behaviors are. And today in our contemporary situation, we find that uh, we have many modern day scribes and Pharisees. Uh, we don't dress like they are, but we perhaps are behaving the same way that they do. When we look at our churches around us, we have our own denominational uh, rules and regulations. You agree with me or not? Yeah, we have our own ecclesiastical laws which we don't even find the Bible. Uh, and even when we do find them in the Bible, we find that it's just a half the truth, not the whole truth. Right? And that's what the Pharisees, their behaviors are like. And there's something that we want to learn and also reflect upon as a church of God, as a people of God. How do we look at our relationship with God? Or how do we practice our religion? Is it about inner values? Or is it about our appearance? If we are not careful, we find that today, churches, we are more and more towards what? Outside appearance, how we project ourselves, how successful we are as a church, how successful or spiritual I am as a believer because I do this, I do this, I do this, I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this. Hey, and you people, you do it this way. It's not right. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. And that's what we want to learn today, right, from Matthew chapter 23. So Jesus now gives some specifics about how these people are behaving. Uh, and so Christ, uh, 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 what I call verdict about these people is that now, look guys, these people, huh, okay, these people, it's not all about God, okay? What they are saying, what they're teaching, what they're doing, what they're trying to present themselves as, don't be fooled. It's not about God. It's all about us, right? It's all about ourselves. It's about my self-image. So Jesus says, no, many things that they do, they do it no, for other people to see. Though they may not uh, verbalize it, lah, huh? but that is the attitude. They just want to show, okay? They just want to show. Or perhaps they are, uh, I would, I may be wrong here, okay? But what, in my own personal observations, a lot of times you need to be very careful about our ministry, our, our serving, no? We have to be careful about this. Is it a projection of ourselves, or, or what we're doing, or is it we are actually no, uh, leading people to worship God, or is it about God? And sometimes if we are not careful also, uh, it could be this. We are just doing out of obligation, we're doing it out of duty. Okay? Now, if uh, no, I've been uh, assigned to, to do it, then I do it. If I'm not assigned, then uh, okay. No, I'm not around. <laughs> right. So this is what Jesus Christ said about uh, this, these two groups of people. Uh, so they are more concerned about themselves uh, and the attention that they want to receive from other people. And so with the, with, the, uh, with the Pharisees, what Jesus said, another thing about them is that no, uh, to distinguish themselves, uh, to distinguish themselves, to show that they are different, they wear special designer clothes. I'm not talking about crocodile, huh? <laughs> okay? I mean, in those days, there's no crocodile brand and all this. But what they do is that they have this, uh, they wear big electric prayer boxes, no? they tie they tie around their forehead or their forearms. People want also small, they want to go double size, on, uh, extra large size. Why? For other people to see. No, the, the outer ropes, uh, the th no, the outer rope, they make it extra long to distinguish themselves. Right. That's what Jesus' uh, verdict about them is. Okay, and then uh, another thing as we go to uh, verse 6 and verse 7, Jesus said that they love the VIP seats. Oh, not only the VIP seats, sorry, the VVIP seats uh, at special functions. So they want the main table. And sometimes we also, we also behave that way, you know, if I'm invited, uh, I'm not sitting at the VIP or VVIP table, I feel slighted, no, I'm, unha I'm uh, unhappy. 
we want all these things. And this is one of the uh, behaviors right, of these uh, scribes and these Pharisees. And in the synagogues, they, they have special reserved seats. I think the, uh, my generation and the uh, more, uh, 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 older generation, we know this. Now, if you come from a Methodist churches, I, I grew up this way. In our Methodist churches, we have special seats at the chancel reserved for the clergy and the liturgies. Uh, the, 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 old, the older churches, right? So a special seat. And I remember when, when I was young, no? Hey, besai che, besai che. This is boksu e kao yi lai. You know what I'm trying to say? Uh, you, cannot, you cannot sit on this because this is a special seat for the pastors. Uh, so we always go, oh, yo. Like, like, so very holy one, no? So like very holy. No. As I think about this, I believe that it's more for convenience, lah, not coming up and down, all these things. But it gives us very special feeling of very special seat. Nobody can uh, sit on. And I also know of a church back in Penang. Literally, right, the pastor pastor's seat, nobody must sit on it or no. Nobody can sit on it. See? So, I mean, uh, this is the attitude you know, that creeps into our life when we are not careful about it. Uh, okay, all right. Then as we go down to verse 7, Jesus Christ exposed or makes us uh, to learn and I think about their behavior so that we can reflect about on it. Is that these people, they adore the special salutations from the masses. They like people calling them rabbis. I don't know if they uh, would be offended if people do not uh, acknowledge or address them this way. But from what the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, the remarks uh, that we read here, they definitely love it. Uh, they definitely love it. I remember when I was young, again, uh, talking about my younger days, my personal encounter is this. Uh, there is a newly ordained pastor. Oh, just recently ordained. In the past, people used to call him Tanto, 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 huh? Preacher, preacher, huh? Okay, that's in the Chinese church, huh? Chuan Tao. But now he's being ordained. We must not call him Chuan Tao, no. We must call him Musu. You don't call him Musu, he's not so happy. Right? You tell us, no, 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 I'm a pastor, you must call me Pastor Reverend. Well, but today we find that our younger pastors are no more in this kind of mold, huh? All right? I know no more in this kind of move, but what I'm sharing is that see, this is the attitude and mentality you know, of people you know, who think a lot about themselves, who think a lot about themselves. And this is something for us to learn, okay? Uh, something for us to learn from. Then in verses 8 to, tw- 8 to 12, Jesus points out to us what actually constitutes humility. And also what he expects of people who would want to walk with him, follow his ways, or to serve him. So in verse 8, very direct, what Jesus says to his listeners, and today we are listeners to God's word, he says, but to you, who? You? Who? Me? Okay? And what does Jesus Christ expect of you and me? Do not behave the same way like they behave. You have to be different. Different not in the sense that they make their tassels longer, so you have to make yours even longer. Not that, right? Look, uh, what value systems are we keeping? They covered after all these things. But we should not, okay, covered after all these things. Or all these vanities. So in verse 8, Jesus says, Do not seek to be called a rabbi, for you have only one master. Now what does Jesus mean here? It means that we are all fellow learners. Uh, Together we learn. A simple understanding of this verse is that, let us don't sit in Jesus' seat, just like the scribes and Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. They think that they are the authority. 
Yes, we may have the, all these trainings and all these things, but let us don't forget we are all fellow learners, fellow pilgrims along the way. No, we are here to learn from one another. The only authority is our Lord Jesus Christ. So don't think of yourself as more authoritative than the Lord Jesus. Uh, sometimes we also find that happening in our midst. Okay? <laughs> So recognize that Jesus is that ultimate teacher. Jesus alone is that ultimate master. So in God's eyes, we are equal. So that's why Jesus says we are all brothers. Uh, meaning that no, let us don't put ourselves one up above the other person. Uh, we learn together. Okay, that is in verse 8. And then in verse 9, Jesus says, And do not call anyone on earth father. You have one Father, and He is in heaven. A little bit difficult to explain this. Does Jesus Christ here mean that, no, I, we can't even call a melody, you cannot call me daddy, you know? Honest, don't call me daddy, you know? Cannot. Then I think our, our Catholic uh, brothers, they have a problem already. Huh? So what does Jesus Christ say? Do not uh, call anyone on earth Father. Jesus is not forbidding or saying that we cannot call your daddy father. Rather, Jesus is warning against this unholy assumption of authority, or authori of authoritative power or status, a God-like status. Sometimes uh, we pastors, uh, uh, pastors, we like to think of ourselves as God. And uh, the, another problem comes is when the congregation treats the pastor like God. Uh, we've got a lot of problems when things like this happen. Right? Whether it is on a pastor's side, you know, who likes to think of himself you know, as that you know, person up there. And the other problem is when the congregation, we treat the pastor like God cannot do wrong one. Right? We know what happens in Singapore. Right? We have a church there. Right? So these are important lessons for the church to learn today no? as we conduct ourselves uh, in God's ministry. So Jesus is saying is that no, let us be careful not to put ourselves uh, to be on par with the divine. Do not put ourselves on par with God. We have only one God. Or in another way, not to put it, don't act... Uh, like you are God. Uh, sometimes we, we, we fall into this uh, sin. Right. So the, in this uh, particular verse, now Jesus is uh, warning us, warning everybody uh, about the uh, pitfalls uh, in the ministry, right, in the churches. So let us learn to be careful because God alone is the Father. Jesus Christ alone is the Master. And so as we go now uh, this uh, passage, you know, uh, Jesus following this, after he has uh, revealed or exposed to us some of the things that we need to be careful, he points out to us what is the right approach to being humble. Right. And so here it says, firstly, let us be mindful of our serving. How do you view yourself? Okay. Uh, how do you look at yourself in your ministry, uh, in your serving God? Do you see yourself as a servant leader or you see yourself as a boss? Uh, so we know, right? In the world, it is those who are in position that lord it over you. But in the church, it's going to be different. If you want to be the leader, you have to be the servant of all. Right? So in verse 11, Jesus says, The greatest among you shall be the servants of all and also as we serve right let us also be clear about this one point ultimately it is what god says about you that counts not what you think about yourself or not what other people say about you uh, it's god's final verdict about us that is the most important uh, and uh, along the way says the bible tells us that now God makes that judgment and God will rec rec recompense accordingly. Now, how you behave and all this, God will be your judge. So, says those who exalt themselves 
will be humbled. And those who humble themselves shall be exalted. Beautiful lesson. So I'd like to close this uh, by uh, saying this. No? When we talk about being humble, or when we talk about uh, humility, we need to understand that humility is a work in progress. Meaning that no, we have to uh, keep on working at it. We can never arrive at that. Right? We keep on learning along the way. So I call this humility is a work in progress. We have to constantly work towards it. And humility is something that is something, uh, it's not something that you claim for yourself or you say that you have, oh, look at me, I'm so humble. The moment you say, yeah, you are humble, you are no more humble. Lah. Okay? Uh, it's not something that we claim for ourselves. Okay? But it is a virtue uh, that other people see about you. Okay? Uh, humility is something other people see about you. So I want to close with these three, uh, these three quotes from uh, three different saints. Okay, first is uh, Augustine, where it says, "It was pride that changed angel uh, into devils, but it is humility that makes men into angels." I I believe that men also include women. Nah, uh, uh, don't feel left out. Oh, no, okay. Uh, that's what the Bible shows us. Uh, because Lucifer, he wanted to be on par with God. He fell. See? But in this world, when uh, all of us now, uh, we learn you know, to care, to be humble, you know, to relate to each other in the way God wants us to relate to them, the world is a beautiful place. Right? So this is what Augustine says. Second from Thomas Merton. Where it says, Pride makes people artificial. Humility makes them real. Agree? Oh, when, when we are proud, no, we, that there's no real relationship or no. no it's very physical. Uh, but when we are really true to each other, when we are humble, uh, it makes our relationship very beautiful. Okay? And the last one is from C.S. Lewis, where he says, Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Right? Beautiful. So as we look at all these three, uh, no beautiful quotes, and we apply this, we know that no, there's something that pleases the Lord. So uh, as a final reminder, I want to say to the church, it says, respect your leaders, respect those who are serving, but be careful of one thing: don't fit their ego. I don't fit their ego. Uh, don't put them so high up on the pedestal uh, because it will make them fall. Right? So what we do is let us support each other. Let us learn that this is not just about pastors, but it's about us as God's children. How we relate to God is also about how we live out uh, God's teaching in our life. Remember, right? our faith is not about our expression. It's not about what I eat or I don't eat. It's not about all these things, right? but it's about the inner values that we hold. So may God be gracious to you and me as we learn and plot along the way. Let us pray. <laughs> Father God, we just want to thank you again for this uh, timely reminder that you give to us. Yes, indeed, God, we acknowledge it is difficult to be humble. So help us always to be mindful of ourselves. Help us also to be mindful of how we relate to you and to each other as we reach out to one another. Help us to remember that it is not about us. It is always about you. So I commit my brothers and sisters to you and also our pastors to you, thanking you for your mercy in accepting us for who we are. And we pray that when we fall, lift us up again. And when we become proud, pray, O oh God, that you knock us. Remind us that what you want from us is that inner value that you look for. So take away not only our old Adam, not only put our old Adam to death, but also take away the scribes and the Pharisees in us so that your name be glorified. Oh God, thank you so much. Thank you for your words to us. For we ask this in Jesus' name.
。阿门。Thank you, Reverend the Chum, for sharing God's word. In response, shall we all rise to sing the closing hymn? O Master, let me walk with thee. House of the Lord, open your eyes to the sights of God's presence all around you. Stay awake and be constantly ready to welcome the Prince of Peace. Put on the clothes of Jesus Christ and walk with the Spirit in the path of light. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. Oh. This morning, uh, worship service ended here, and uh, wishing you a blessed heaven. May the hope of love, joy, and peace of God abide with us always. See you next week. Thank you. God bless.